Chief Tucker, uh, thank you for allowing us to do that. So if you guys are ready. Uh, so today's presentation is a ghost squadron of Vietnam. So we have like a double header tonight for today. And hope, hope you'll stay for the entire event. Flying in at piloting hours are 2814 as a pilot, 
886 as special crew, that's navigating, manning other crew positions, etc., for a total of 3,700 hours in this aircraft. 2,325,000 hours were spent as a PPC, or a patrol plane commander. His career flight time was 6,222 hours, 900 of which were actual instrument time. From 1956 to 1962 with a short period there for initial flight training, Bob spent time in four squadrons flying six of eight versions of the P-2. These stats more than qualify him as an expert on this aircraft. Plus, he has enough sea stories that he'd be delighted to tell you. It would prove his pedigree, but also scare the daylights out of you. Here's Bob. As I got ready to stand up here, Vic reminded me that he's heard many of my sea stories already. <laughs> Okay, first Neptune, first P2D, 1945, it was an overwater anti-submarine sub surface ship surveillance aircraft, flying many, many, many miles to sea to see what the enemy was doing. That's the first one. That's Burbank Airport where the Lockheed plant was, and some of your airline folks here will notice some super connies being built in the background. All that is what we now call Lumbo Airport in Burbank. That was the first plane. It had a a small 50 caliber turret in the nose that was uh, remotely operated. Went on to the next version of the airplane, that's the P2V1, that set a record, a record that still holds for reciprocating engine aircraft 11, over 11,000 miles. So that was a P2V1 with the nose of a P2V2 that it was in the 50 caliber machine guns in it, fixed mount. Uh, the Air Force finally broke that record, it took them about 10 years, they did it with a B-52, uh, added one, another thousand miles, but that, this record still stands. P-2B-2 came along and then P uh, P-2B-3C came along. Uh, the Lockheed Company produced the P-2V for 15 years, in the first 10 years of production, they cranked out seven different models, and of those seven different models, there was many subclasses. So that they all came up with a particular purpose. This one was a nuclear bomber. JDO assisted takeoff. The concept was the aircraft would fly from the carrier to wherever they wanted to drop the bomb, drop it, and run like hell to get out of there, and then recover at a friendly base, or if there was no friendly base, they would fly back and ditch the aircraft alongside the carrier. That was the type of mission. They tried uh, over 200 practice carrier landings ashore. However, they could never figure out the safety to get it to land on board the carrier. The wing tip, tip clearance just wasn't enough. It was even tight for the takeoffs. There's another jet assist to take off, and they set a record. You can see the distance that they flew. Uh, again, trying to uh, have a nuclear capability that our nation very much needed. And fortunately, uh, some subsequent aircraft, the A3J Savage, the A5J, and the A3D came along, designed for carriers with folding wings. So they took over the mission, and the P2Bs no longer flew it. For those of you that are familiar with the Midway class aircraft carrier, of course, you see one down in San Diego. If you look at the side of it, it does not have the Midway today. It does not have all those five inch guns. Look how that ship was armed right at the end of World War II. Kept modifying the aircraft here just uh, four years after it was introduced. We were up to the fourth model. This one was now more particularly designed to open ocean surveillance, that radar reached out 200 miles to pick up surface ships and a little closer you can pick up a snorkeling submarine or other targets. They put in what was called ASW radio sauna buoys that was about a five inch diameter, three foot long uh, electronic device that had a hydrophone and an antenna on it and would broadcast back to the aircraft uh, signals from the sound of a submarine. 
And one thing they put in the numbers was six 20 millimeter cannons, quite a bit of firepower. The aircraft also carried 16 5 inch Havar rockets. They were used in Korea both for surface uh, surveillance, but also occasionally in country. That was quite a bit of firepower. Changed the gunner arrangement, uh, put a, a manned gun turret on the nose now, 20 millimeter. Gave more capability to uh, strafe a, a surface submarine or a struggling submarine or other target because you can move the guns rather than having to maneuver the airplane to try to hit the target. They added some more uh, electronics inside and one thing they put on was a 70 million candle power searchlight out there in the right wing. That thing would put out a beam about a mile long and you could actually see a, a snorkel of a submarine going by or a periscope. Uh, very, very brilliant. It was also a hazard because if, as you're a pilot, if you meant you'd light that searchlight off, you want to look to where the searchlight's going. That's going downhill. The, the habit was you would fly subconsciously right down that beam into the water. So we became very, very disciplined. The plane captain, which would sit between the two pilots, would hold up something like a clipboard over the pilot's eyes. So all you could see was the instrument panel. You didn't want to look anywhere else. Uh, it was very effective. Uh, a lot of things. This, incidentally, this picture shows those rock, uh, 16 rockets hanging under the wing. P 2 7 here, nine years after they started the airplane, they're up to the seventh model. This one now had jet engines hung under the wing, give it extra power for takeoff and also in an emergency or if you needed high speed. The weight was increased. They put a very nice cockpit on it called a bubble cockpit. You could actually stick your head over to the side and look almost straight down. And a lot more visibility for open ocean surveillance. This particular picture is taken uh, at the end of a squadron deployment. We've been to uh, Iwakuni, Japan. The old squadron of 12 planes is flying back down to the United States. We did that in uh, three plane formations all together. Mid-50s, a big change in the aircraft. The Russian submarines were becoming nuclear. They were harder and harder to catch. So they increased the technology, the much better equip equipment for picking up the submarines. That added a lot of weight to the aircraft. They filled up the inside. So they took the guns off, too heavy, put on the observer nose, and it's hard to see in this particular picture, but there's a fiberglass extension of the tail that sticks way out that had what's called the mad stinger, magnetic anomaly detector. You could fly over a submarine, which is metal, that affects the Earth's magnetic field, and you get an indication on a dial of any aircraft. This particular picture is taken up at uh, Anak and the Aleutian Islands, way out towards the end of the Aleutians, uh, very close to where the Russian submarine base was in the Kamandorsky Peninsula, or Petropavlovsk. That's my airplane. I was a lieutenant aircraft commander at that time. And the, the green stuff grown on the ground, if any of you are familiar with the Aleutians, that's all that grows. There's no trees, there's no bushes. The weather's so lousy that the only thing grows is this short stuff. Very, very strange to just look around and see no trees. I want to talk a little bit, a couple of specifics on the airplane. To get into the airplane, you would walk, tuck, tuck your head down, get in behind the nose wheel, and there was a ladder that went up. You came up about four steps on the ladder, bent over, slid into a tunnel, and then crawled about uh, three crawls, and then you could stand up, go up a couple of steps, and be up in where the flight deck was. That's how you got in the airplane. That was for the crew that was up forward of the wing. The crew after the wing would go up in a hatch that was in the bottom of the aircraft, back about where uh, you could see Navy on the slide. That was the two ways to get into the airplane. If you were to bail out of the airplane, that was your two exits. The other thing is it's a mid-wing airplane, and I'll show you a little bit about what a mid-wing airplane did for the crew. We went through a lot of color changes for several years. That's one of them. 
Uh, they also uh, came up even a version for a while was unpainted. A totally just an aluminum airplane. It really looked funny because aluminum, the various manufacturing processes can have various different tints. So you had an airplane that would look like a patchwork quilt. All, all basic aluminum. Late 50s, the P2V models were upgraded so it would be just like the P2V7. All the electronics, the plastic nose, and DOD uh, changed the airplane nomenclature and they all became SP2Es. And that was going to be the future of Ops Ground 67's airplanes. There was a lot of other variations. They had skis on them several times for operations in the Antarctic. The one in the middle was a P2V6. It was a mine layer to lay air, aircraft and prop mines off of harbors. Later became a missile carrier. Then later was one, like the one on the right corner, upper corner, became a trainer, different color. The uh, RV-69 in the left corner down there is uh, kind of masquerading as an Air Force airplane and really belonged to the CIA. They had seven of them. They flew them all over the world, uh, very clandestine uh, operations. They lost five of them. Uh, they finally gave the remaining two back to the Navy. I learned uh, just recently that the CIA will release the history of that aircraft and what they did with it in 2022. And good old Navy retired, you always have to have something to do in retirement. You can see there was many, many P2Bs became firebombers. Little statistics for those that like it. There's horsepowers and a few things like that. Uh, they, they call it uh, 264 knots with the jet engines on it. Um, I think that's a little bit high. I've had them up around 340. It's a very strange feeling for an airplane that normally flies at about 100, 150 to 180, which would be a level flight. When you've got the jets on and going fast, your attitude's like this, the nose is down, you're still along this way. Very unusual feeling. The, the jet engines were very important to be lost in power on the reciprocating engine. You had an extra engine you could light off and run. The big disadvantage of the jets, they sucked up fuel like crazy and they did burn ab gas just like the aviation, the reciprocating engines. That's the cockpit of uh, SP2E. They started adding things as the airplanes uh, matured. And you can see where the two blue arrows are. That's the jet engine throttles were cranked in on the upper part of the console. And then the instruments were stuck up above the uh, windscreen. That's the flight deck. If you look on the left, you can see where it says forward entry. That's where you, where you would get in, through by the nose wheel into the tunnel. Then you would stand up there and you could work your way forward up into the cockpit. Uh, you can know that you could not stand up. The most you could get up in the airplane was about like this to move around. Uh, very, very crowded. And you can imagine trying to bail out, and get past all that to uh, get out of the airplane. Just turn the camera around and look aft. You can see I have an arrow there to the wing beam. That's where the wing of the aircraft went through the, cock the uh, flight deck. So everybody forward of the flight deck that was going to get out, if they went out the back, they had to make a quick run and a dive across that wing beam to uh, get out. Very proud. Neptunes in Vietnam, the left hand, the market time, that was regular uh, standard P2V, open ocean surveillance of the supplies. North Vietnamese was trying to, trying to get down in country. The Project Trim, uh, night attack, low light level TV, infrared, a few other things. The Army had, I think it was uh, about 12, called Crazy Cats. They were full electronics, 14-man uh, crew, 14, 12 to 14-hour missions, both uh, active and passive electronics. And the Able the White Birds are the ones we're going to be talking about. Their bases, you can see the star there, that's where the OP-2s were based. All the rest of the P-2Bs were based down at Camp Ron, where the blue dot is. Modifications to the aircraft to get it ready for this secret mission. Let your 
to read through that. I'm sure in reading that you detected that the squadron was doing something more than observing. And the uh, interesting thing, they dug out of the archives a flight, the manuals on how to operate the, the Norman bomb site, and they found a bunch of Norman bomb sites, refurbished them, and put them in the airplanes for their mission. Little visual of what uh, the changes were in the aircraft. And why the artist used a, a Dutch P2B as a comparison, I have no idea. There's the after machine guns, they made the hatch a lot bigger, and two machine guns back there. There's the Norton bomb site. <coughs> Incidentally, if you are interested in the history, you can go to the uh, Hall of Heroes over at the Arrow <coughs> Fairgrounds, and there is the Norton bomb site up on the second floor of the building there, an actual bomb site. Now, a little bit more about the O67, we'll turn it back to Steve. On November 15, 1967, the last three OPQEs arrived at Nakhon Phnom Royal Thai Air Force Base, also known by the pilots that live there as Naked Fan or NKP. You can see the close proximity of the targets they would be located, the Ho Chi Minh Trail and even uh, the combat base at Khe Sanh, right on the border. I get this thing to work. Right on the border of, uh, of uh, Thailand. And there's Laos, and of course both of these targets, there's a DMZ in case on Ho Chi Minh Trail Bar right there. This is the flight line at Nakhon Phnom in 1967 as they were assembling their aircraft. The mission of the O-67 was to detect, classify, and destroy North Vietnamese infiltration into South Vietnam by dropping sensors on the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos. The Air Force Task Force Alpha ran Operation Eagle from Thailand for this purpose. Of course, as you know, U.S. military forces were not officially uh, cleared to be in Laos. This mission was top secret. No records or orders were kept. Nothing. Medals and rivers were not awarded. The crews were sworn to secrecy for life. This is the weapon that was used. The Navy's Sono buoy a listening device used to detect submarines underwater were modified to be dropped into the jungle canopy uh, above the trail to detect NBA movement. Sitting above the trail, sensitive microphones. Replacing the hydrophones could pick up the sound of the enemy. Now called Accu buoys, they were always dropped at 500 feet. Pilots often used terrain masking, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Jinking dives and numerous heading changes to the target in or order to uh, avoid the anti-aircraft gun emplacements. The final run was on the deck, pull it back up to 500 feet, lay the sensors back on the deck, and get the heck out. There's the, with the plate on it there, you can see the microphones. Here it is with the uh, antennas deployed. This is pretty much what the uh, the triple canopy and what it all looked like. So those things laying up there on the trees were quite easily done. And it was a catacomb of trails, not just one trail, but tons of other trails off of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. All headed for the same place. It's a story that got back to the squad. One Aki boy picked up enemy voices and sounds over a hill from the Quezon base. Marines opened up with artillery fire in the position. Fortunately, the Marine monitoring the sensor spoke Vietnamese. He could hear this. And he heard the screams and someone shouting to get to the top of the hill and kill the spotter who was giving away their position. Of course, there was no spotter. The other weapon was the ADSID, the Air Delivered Seismic Intrusion Detector. It was four feet high and eight inches in diameter. <coughs> the ADSID usually stuck in the turf. Uh, these are so sensitive that almost any seismic movement be detected. <coughs> Once detected, this data would go up to a C-121 orbiting at about 20,000 feet. 
It would be instantly relayed to a huge comp center back in Thailand. It would decide what to do with the target, relay it back to a FAC aircraft on site. Up to a C-130 who would then order a four-plane strike. Hopefully, all this happened with, uh, within minutes. The fact then marks the spot. The rest is history. Here's what it looks like before being placed on the airplane. And here it is, right outboard of the, uh, the little jet engine there, <coughs> the wing station. And here it is coming off the airplane. When the NBA did find these, they'd move them away from their positions. They figured that they, they weren't uh, uh, accurate anymore. Well, they were accurate because it didn't matter once it was moved. The Air Force text, they knew where the original position that they, that they were and that that must be where the enemy was. So they just ignored the movement and uh, called airstrikes. Today in Laos, they use them as a decorative item. See, there's a little humor I've been objecting in there. So Bob alluded to the North bomb site. And uh, its need for it was because the ANSYS need to be dropped from 2,500 feet or higher. Uh, so the crews needed help, the P-2 uh, crews needed help in making accurate drops. So the Rock Island uh, Arsenal, the maker, recalled uh, World War II technicians to rebuild, in fact, 12 old Norton bomb sites. A retired Air Force uh, Norton instructor found a battered old World War II uh, training film, Bob mentioned, at the Smithsonian Institute and used it to train the relief pilots as bombardiers. Instructor Lieutenant Colonel Conrad Brown even deployed with the squadron to continue training. And I'll be darned, it worked. This is a page from a World War II bombardier's information file or a BIF. It describes all the components and everything else that's in it. It's an actual picture, an archived World War II picture. I don't know what airplane it was taken from, but that's the view through the Norton bomb site. This is a, an ad that appeared in a magazine during the war, World War II, uh, told of the importance of not only the book Ford, Norton and bon, uh, Boeing together, what a great team they were, but it also talked about uh, the security. Uh, the, the bombardier nicknamed this, uh, his bomb site, the Blue Ox. And of course, uh, Boeing wanted to sell airplanes and everything else after the war. Uh, he they, it says in the article, an American a bombardier a Blue Ox and the Flying Fortress are the most formidable bombing uh, team in the world. And that's the one Bob found over and photographed for us over at the Hall of Heroes or Heroes Hall there right across the street here. So how did VO-67 learn how to fly their mission, acquire targets, and avoid AAA fire? These guys were sailors. They didn't know anything about bombing uh, trails or trees or anything else in Vietnam. Well, they learned from U.S. Air Force forward air controllers, we'll call facts, flying in tiny airplanes. This is the 23rd, 23rd Tactical Air Support Squadron, or the 23rd TAS. This was a squadron that, that they met uh, at NKP when they arrived. They considered themselves traffic cops of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. These are some of the patches they created. There was a great camaraderie between the 067 with the Air Force facts. And the Air Force facts trained the 067 pilots and proved how to fly the hard air, as the facts called it, of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Soon after their arrival, the uh, 067 commanding officer, Captain Wally Sharp, threw a big party for the, their fa they called it their facts, their facts squadron, at the uh, Naked Fanny Officers Club. That night, very close to lasting friendships, developed between the pilots. Captain Sharp became fast friends with Lieutenant Colonel John Pulaster, commanding officer of the 23rd Task. Pulaster was so respected by all of the BO-67 pilots and officers that when he was promoted to full colonel in NKP, the BO-67 officers threw him a wedding, traditional Navy wedding down party. They also made him an honorary Naval Navy, gave him a set of wings too. Anybody been part of a wedding down party? Was it the real thing? Did they throw you in the ocean? Well, they did. They threw you seals in the ocean, didn't they? And, and what was the purpose? Free deployment. Promotion. Promotion for a free deployment. Yes. Who paid for the party? Everybody that went. Okay. Well, traditionally, the guy that's getting promoted pays for the 
because he's saying goodbye to all the, the officers that were his rank at the time. He's moving up. He's probably going to be in command of them, if, if, if that's possible. And it was usually in the ocean in his dress uniform. If it was too cold, uh, and he might freeze, they, uh, they get a bucket, put ice in a bucket of water, and hopefully a fish, pour it over his head. Of course, there was a little bit of drinking going on, <laughs> just a little. And the, uh, of course, they, they patted the guy in the head and told him what a wonderful guy he was, and of course, made fun of him as to his faults. But it was all uh, done in uh, the spirit of uh, fun. Well, that night, uh, Wally, Wally Sharp made sure that the uh, plaster didn't pay for his wedding down party. He picked up the bill for that one. So BO-67 pilots began flying combat missions with the FACS in O-2 aircraft to learn spotting and noting targets. Altitudes to fly, approaches and departure routes to take and delivering the sensors. The FACS flew night and day, marking and charting any aircraft locations for the next day BO-67's missions to avoid. In fact, two FAC pilots helped rescue seven BO-67 crew with a full jolly green after being hit by AAA bailing out. Bob's going to read that first person account of one of the men that bailed out of that in just a moment. And when I say a full jelly green, that's what we call it anyway. That's what's meant by it. It's a combat search and rescue task force, uh, Air Force. Uh, Air Force called the Sky Raiders uh, Sandys, and four of those went for, uh, to protect the pilot or the crew on the ground. And of course, two jelly greens, one isn't there to get a drink yet. And of course, an H HC-130P Combat King was also the command and control aircraft on site as well as the fuel. <coughs> Just for a FYI, uh, those missions saved 3,883 lives during the Vietnam War, both in North and South Korea, costing 71 rescuers and 45 aircraft. This is what they were looking for. This is exactly what the, uh, what the sensors were looking for. And that's what the Air Force was looking for to come through them and kill. They may have no idea that his movement, even his voice transmissions, can be clearly heard by the sensors, such as this at this NBA truck park. At any one time, there were 3,000, 6,000 trucks on the trail. The U.S. Air Force reported truck kills tripled after the 067 began planning the sensors. Even Sam's made a trip south to protect the trail. Can you pick out the Russian technicians? <laughs> Blonde hair, white shirts, and little red stars on their bellies. And you can see all the, all the stuff put up in the trees there to, uh, to form a little bit more camouflage. This is the O2A and B models. A pusher puller, a decent civilian airplane, but one of the loudest small airplanes ever. Not ideal for quiet reconnaissance. Pilots also uh, also indicated that made a huge racket inside. This is the aircraft that 23rd Task flew when the 067 arrived at NKP. And we have an O2 pilot here at the, at the Freedom Committee that, that told me once that, that don't count on flying very long in the O2 on one engine. Of course, more humor I'm injecting, like my <laughs> wife told me to. This is what the uh, the back pilots thought of it. They instead of uh, what, what was it a uh, push pull? They call it the suck blow. In the <laughs> it was also known as the Oscar Deuce or the Duck. This is a Cessna uh, modified civilian Cessna 337 Skymaster. Initially, 350 were ordered by the Air Force. The first O2s in country went to the 20th task located at Don Ha in support of the Quezon combat base. This was a more substantial aircraft than the O-1 Bird Dog, of course, for the fight to fly and to deal with the improvements in the enemy's weapons. Still a terribly vulnerable against these big guns, but the O-2 did fill the void until the OB-10s were ready to pick up that mission. Some more humor. You can see why it's called the duck why they call it the duck. It looks like its legs are either coming out or going up inside, if you've ever seen a duck land. You can see how low these things got. That looks like a train tracks and a, a bridge right there. And of course, they painted the tops of the wings. They didn't do it at first, but they saw what a great contrast it would make with the ground if they painted the wing surfaces uh, white 
And you can see this one's all gunned up. It's got the machine gun pod there. And of course, it's Willie Pete. Why would you paint that on the top of your wings of your airplane? The fact. Well, you're flying low and slow. You can see the little guy down here. Well, you can see the arrow. Follow the arrow and you see a fact plane. And you can see them. He's marked the target. So you're flying low and slow. You're looking for the target. Marking the target. You get shot at by the target. You're avoiding a bit, trying to avoid a mid-air collision from the fixed wing you just called in. Of course, you're flying bomb da damage assessment after each time uh, your fixed wing goes in to attack it. Then you got to remark maybe and reassign the target, and then you just got to get out of the way. I guess you'd call it self-preservation. This is an artist's reenactment of kind of a nice picture of what, it, what the fact, uh, the little process looked like. You can see the fixed wing coming in. He's just verbally and visually checked in with the fact and said, I see you. I see your wings. You're out of the way. And I'm going to miss you. And off in the distance, you can see the marker. And of course, here comes the, the black arrow there, shows you a, a marking round coming out. He spotted something with his little dash mounted uh, gun sight. And you can see it down amongst the, the trees there, and he's going to put a marker in. He must have been down there lower to see what was there. He's gained some altitude now and going to mark it. This is what the flying conditions were like in uh, Vietnam and Laos. He says, flying at night in Vietnam and Laos scared the hell out of me. High humidity caused a haze that totally obscured the horizon. There were no lights on the ground in the mountains or jungles. Flying at night in Southeast Asia was instrument flight. You can imagine that. Nobody flies on instruments close to the ground, but our mission required us close to the ground. We faxed used enemy campfires and friendly fire to identify targets. Here you can see the weather. Now, the bottom here, if I can get my arrow on it, that's a little 01 on a runway, taxiing or what have you. This is a H-34. Both of these aircraft are probably Air America or CIA aircraft. You can see the vast mountains in Laos. So maybe almost, uh, almost invisible uh, on a horizon. And uh, even during the daytime, VFR flying in Laos was impossible. Another FYI, 70% of Laos is mountains. There's an immense a spine of limestone mountains. These are called karsts that run the full reading all through Southeast Asia, but right down the middle of the entire country of Laos. They used to mask their presence by jinking and diving, diving around at low altitudes around these hills and around these mountains to hopefully get out of the view of the guns. View 67 did the same. This is an O2 victim of the haze, or night flying, one of the two. The Ghost Squad also lost one of its aircraft and crew, crew number two, in this manner on a morning mission. There, unfortunately, happens to be crew two, and uh, the names of some of those that were killed in the uh, flying into a mountain. Recognition came from the thankful Marines and all the other service, services present in Quezon. All over the country today, there are plaques. There are many plaques, there are many uh, memorials, there have been books written, uh, letters, memoirs, praising and thanking the men of Neo 67 for their very lives. Able to stay within the perimeter of the base without risking life and limb. On patrol, due to the accurate information derived from the two types of sen sensors, saved an unknown number of men. The sensors vastly improved all targeting. The men on the hills surrounding Quezon especially felt safe. Nightly, the North Vietnamese Army attempted to overrun them, but thanks to BO-67. Artillery, fixed-wing attack aircraft, even B-52 arc lights came often and were almost always accurate in protecting them. There's no better recognition than from your fellow warriors and brothers in arms, who continue, continue to this day with their utmost thanks. One of the surprise, surviving Navy chaplains of the siege at Quezon, Reverend Ray Stu, wrote a letter to a member of BO-67 crew that read, Indeed, were it not for those of you that inserted those sensors, I probably wouldn't be writing you this letter. And I sure as heck wouldn't have been able to talk to you when you called. You and those in your unit quite literally saved our lives. Reverend Stu co-authored a book about Quezon entitled Valley of Decision, 
Reverend Stu spent over 100 days on Hill 881 South under the guns of the North Vietnamese uh, Army. Finally, the awards came. These are some of the medals awarded to members of BO67, some 30 to 40 years after service. And we'll talk about that Navy Cross in a minute. Eight distinguished flying crosses, 27 Purple Hearts, 20 of them posthumously were awarded. Military planners, of course, they didn't tell the members of BO67 this when they came aboard, uh, actually planned and predicted for 70% fatalities to the crews. But due to the pilot's outstanding airmanship, and of course, the uh, early Air Force pack training, three aircraft and 20 crewmen were lost. The presidential unit citation up there is reserved for the most valorous combat units. Far fewer of them were awarded during the Vietnam War than Medals of Honor. A unit receiving the citation is the equivalent of every person receiving a Navy Cross. The PUC was eventually awarded to BO67 in 2007. The Ghost Squadron received no official mention or support of its, of its support at Quezon for over 40 years. In 2005, the United States Marine Corps awarded the crews of BO-67 the Silver Combat Air Crew Combat Wings for valor above Quezon in support of them. The OP-2E supporting Quezon carried cameras that, were, that filmed where the active buoys and ad sits were dropped. Photo interpretations with that radar direction finder I showed you the exact location of the sensors and allow the Marines to pinpoint enemy troop positions and movement. The radio chatter around the base was intense. Even the Marines didn't recognize they were Navy planes. One radio transmission said, look out, it was one of those big green planes right on the deck again. Now there's more details about that rescue first person. But Bob's gonna When uh, Steve started putting this presentation together, it caught my interest in that uh, when the word started coming out about uh, 10 years ago about what the squadron had done, I learned that the commanding officer of the squadron, Wally Sharp, I had served a tour with the aircraft commander of the first airplane lost I had been in the squadron with when I was a brand new ensign, and the one of the other uh, pilots in command he and I had pinned our wings on each other at Hutchison, Kansas in 1953, 1955. So I had an association with the squadron even before Steve asked me to help out here a little bit. Uh, we did reach out uh, via a couple of friends to a, an officer who had uh, been in one of the crews that was shot down, and he did give us a statement about his uh, uh, experience. It's pretty hard to get information on the squadron and the people because of the way they were treated. Uh, it did not help their careers. They, uh, since there was no record that they had done heroic work, uh, they didn't get promoted. Uh, there, there's a lot of bitterness among the survivors. But this is a survivor's comment about a bailout. Yes, I did bail out of a burning OP-2 on 27 February 1968. On the ground in Laos for about four hours until the Jolly Greens picked me up amid sporadic single shot small arms fire. That indicated that we were off the main trail network where they would have had heavy weapons. The rift was the ride of my life. The Hiva was winching me up through the jungle while getting the hell out of there at max speed. They had already picked up another crewmate. My working tank got hit by Triple A on the run down the whole team in trail, dropping off the buoys. They were supposed to hang up in the trees and provide intelligence on movers coming down the trail. There were two altitudes for the drop, low level or treetop, and 5,000 feet. We were on a 5,000 foot run when we were hit by the AA. In the hydraulic lines, it created a fire and dense smoke that made it hard to breathe. The fire emanated from the nose tunnel so we went over the wing beam and out the after station hatch. We landed, I landed at the base of a sharp mountain ridge called a coast, that jungle up to the edge. I could see the chute, climb the ridge to about 200 feet above. 
I walked to the trailer. I used to do our Sunday meal called on the Johnny Greens. Seven of the nine of us made it out. One was killed aboard, and the plane commander, who got a daily cross for holding the bird together, was missing in action. The seven of us were scattered over Laos and were picked up by the Jollies over the next few hours. We had a senior officer, plane commander, each airplane, and co pilot who was a young guy that was a aircraft commander fresh from the patrol plane community. Three planes stored in Okanagan's war reserves were soon brought in country as we lost birds. No one got out of the first two, so as soon as we were hit, our plane commander called bailout and we went, went down quickly. I could see the plane in the ball of fire as I went down in the air. So we lost 18 men in the first two aircraft lost and two in our plane. After our plane was hit, the wheels of the Sing Pan Commander in Chief Pacific stopped us from flying the main trails. We just flew minor trails until we finished up in June. We were supposed to be a temporary aircraft until the F-4 arrives which was the airplane supposed to be the delivery bird. We were the end of the delivery bird until the Air Force had Fords around. That was a statement from one of the pilots. Back to Steve. That plane commander was Commander Paul Melius, and he was seen to bail out of that aircraft, but his remains were never found. He remained at the controls until all bailed out. One O2 FAC pilot, Major Sam Weaver, flew alongside the crippled OP2E as the crew bailed out and plotted where each crewman landed. Another 23rd task uh, FAC, Major Phil Maynard, also came to the party and called in the, the search and rescue. Soon Sandys and Jolly Greens were on scene. The FAC spectred the helos to each of the downed crewmen since they were all in a very hostile area the Jolly Greens wasted no time in picking up. The crew in getting out. As Bob just read, VO-67 was an interim fix. This mission temporary while the Air Force modified its F Force for the task. By July 1st, 1968, VO-67 was quietly shut down. The Ghost Squadron only lasted a little over 500 days. Almost finished now. Commander Lee Melius was posthumously and quietly promoted to the rank of captain in 1972 was officially pronounced presumed killed in action and then much later posthumously awarded that Navy Cross we saw. In 1996, the Aegis guided missile de uh, destroyer Melius, DDG-69, was commissioned in his honor. The ship's motto, others before myself, reflected the courage that promoted his self selfless act of, of uh, battle. This is the end, the aftermath. As Bob alluded, the Navy assured that the men it would be good for their careers to join this squadron. So many men volunteered for it. A lot more, of course, were drafted to join Observation 67. Only called 67 because that was the year was born. After a while, the men took to calling themselves the Ghost Squadron because they felt forgotten, participated in a war, a secret war that neither the U.S. nor North Vietnam wanted to acknowledge was being waged next door to Vietnam. As for their careers in the Navy, the men said BO-67 failed to help them at all. In fact, many of them believe it hurt their promotion chances and career because no one in the Navy had ever heard of it. One crewman remarked one evening, I've talked recently about with my wife of 19 years, and she said, I don't believe you. This is vindication enough. And Merry Christmas to you. Yeah, for dinner, I don't need any questions. <laughs>